You arrived to find the man distraught here, and he took you out to show you. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Herman came over to me in a very excited manner and told me that first I would not believe what had happened to him, and I just expected the worst. I didn't know what to believe, and he said he'd been in his yard in North Charleston, which is about 15 miles from here. And the next thing he knew, he was here in this field near Somerville. Right out in, right in the middle of the field is where he said he was seen too. He doesn't really remember too much of what had happened that night. But they'd been watching a bright light. It kept getting closer and closer. And the next thing he knew, he was here in this field and he told me he believed he'd been brought here by a UFO. He was very excited, nervous. Uh, I really have never seen a man that excited, you know, it's hard to put in words, but very excited is about all I could say. Distressed, he couldn't remember what had happened to him. There was, you know, a small part of his life was blank. Bill could only remember small fragments of hazy images, images that resembled a strange mosaic tapestry of colors and things. The object approaching, falling backwards, the field of grass swaying in silence, struggling in a bluish light to bathe the railroad tracks, then black out. Stevens knew he would have to bring in a specialist in hypnotic regression, someone capable of unlocking Bill's scrambled memory, but this would take time to set up. In the meantime, he would call in Junichi Aoi, a seasoned UFO investigator with the Nippon Television Network. And between the two men, they would carefully reconstruct the strange events that led up to Herman's abduction. Three months earlier, this had been a construction site for a new subdivision. It had offered Bill and his wife Patty a panoramic view of the surrounding area to observe the bright, noiseless object in the night sky. Particular evening we were out here. We were sitting. It was about a little after 9:30, almost 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw the object come up. My wife and I. We saw the object coming up this way, yeah. up the river, and it was about maybe 900,000 feet above the water. Mm -hmm. Just a disk of uh, whitish light. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of rapidly gained altitude, going up at an apex. Mm -hmm. triangle, if you don't understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we lost sight of it for a moment. We were both standing outside the car. All of a sudden, right over this area, the big light, just the light that was coming straight for us. Our car is parked over that direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got frightened. My wife got frightened very much. And uh, we just left. We just, I turned the car, jumped in the car and turned the car on and started to speed out. And the uh, looking in the rear view mirror, I saw the light look like it reversed its course and oh. started going back toward the river. In other words, in other words, when we close. right when we left, uh -huh. when we you know when, when we were gone, the object came toward our car, oh. and then it like it changed its mind or dropped following us, uh -huh. and it just went back the opposite direction. Oh, how big was it when it came close to you? Oh man, the lights were that huge. Big, big old spotlights, like there's spotlights coming straight for us. Oh. And my wife was particularly terrified because, you know, we didn't know what, was, what was, we didn't know what was going to go on. Uh -huh. um, so she said, "Let's get out of here." And <laughs> we left, man. We just, we was gone. Uh, have you seen the detail of the UFO itself, or just like? Well, you could see a shape behind the lighting. Oh yeah. And when it looked like my, like a dull metal finish. Mm -hmm. 
and the lighting itself kind of the more more of the lighting stood out than the detail of the object. But the object was it looked metallic, you know, like a metallic skin, but the light in the front of the object. How was the distance between yours and the uh, oh, UFO? If, I, when if I'd have had a camera or a rock or anything, I could have thrown it and hit the bottom of it. That's how close it got to the car. And I, you know, it was just a matter of seconds. I mean, if we hadn't gone and we did, there's no way the object couldn't have intercepted our car. Uh -huh. now, I'm, I'm very convinced if it wanted to catch us, it could have. You know, because it seemed to be moving that fast coming up from the river. Was it before your abduction? Yes, it was. Before? It was before so the abduction. Was it... Uh, I was with my wife and my daughter, so I didn't know... You know, I didn't want to take any kind of chances on anything. Mm -hmm. So I, we, we, we just left. Okay. Oh, so you should be very frightened. That particular reason we were. Because <laughs> all the other sightings were just simply watching something moving in the sky and never uh -huh. anything coming close that close to us. I guess I should have looked down the road then, but I, I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. I, up to that time, I was convinced what I saw was a military project. I never believed it was from a, a, another world or anything. I, but I, since the area is in such close proximity to the Air Force Base, because like this area is a flight landing pattern for commercial yeah. aircraft mm -hmm. and sometimes military aircraft. And the, uh, you know, that's my, that was my thoughts back then. Noticing that Bill is near emotional trauma, Junichi quickly changes the subject. And then most of the sightings afterwards, one of those or a C-130 turboprop would come up and down the river, just fly up and down the river. And all I kept thinking, wow, man, I never, I don't believe this. Because, you know, one of the uh, feelings in my mind, in my thoughts, was, you know, when you see something, it seems distant. In other words, removed from you personally mm -hmm. but this thing reacted personally in other words that not only were we watching it but it by proving by coming toward us it was watching us mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. not just performing the delight but but it seemed to react to our personal presence and it reacted by coming toward us and of course it's frightened us because i never saw it that close yeah. and, we, and we left after the frightening experience patty's fear would overcome her curiosity she would beg Bill to please leave well enough alone. He would agree until three weeks later on a Sunday morning. Patty was home, I believe. Me and our daughter was sick and she couldn't go to church. So I got in my car to go to church. And I'm driving down Dorchester Road. And since that last Friday, and I had kept my camera in my car fully loaded. I wasn't thinking about UFOs. In fact, I was listening to some hymns on the radio, Christian hymns. Just minding my own business when this thing shoots across the road. Silver, with a halo of light on the bottom of it, and the pretty thing I ever saw. At first it was silver, pure silver, and then it just changed like somebody got a red stat in a dining room mm -hmm. and turned it. Bright, dim. This thing was going up to this way and back this way and back this way. And getting so precise in its movement, that's where I connected, determined my mind, triangular pattern because it went up like a triangle mm -hmm. and it skid up and down this way and I don't know the purpose of it maybe to attract my attention I don't know <laughs> the triangular flight patterns would remain a mystery and although the photographs were good they would pale in comparison to those he would take later as the investigative team neared the location where Bill took his dramatic new series Stevens became concerned we would be filming near a strategic U.S. Air Force base, and I was concerned that this might cause problems for all of us. As a retired lieutenant colonel with the U.S. Air Force, I knew that the military could be unpredictable at times, especially when you have a foreign film team operating on the edge of a restricted flight line. And we were here investigating an unidentified flying object, a UFO, that was intruding the military airspace. Yes, I was concerned. Ready? Oh, 
session at this site was most intriguing. Had Bill simply followed a hunch, or had he been telepathically guided to the location? Another mystery without any clues. Like I say, I, I was at work, and I left work, come home, was on my way home. Uh -huh. and on my way home, I, I had that thought. It was like a impulse see, telling me to, you know, do, go somewhere. And I I started to think, where should I go for myself? And then it was like in my mind, I got a mental picture of this area. Mm -hmm. And I knew it was near the air base. I knew where everybody parked. Got back here, and I wasn't back here 10 minutes when I could see the object. I don't know exactly where I saw it first, mm -hmm. but it like it circled the area and I saw it. And I saw, the first thing I noticed was it was much smaller. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, Prior to other ones were anywhere from 40 to 65 foot in diameter, but this one was 20, 30 foot. And uh, another thing was it was very, very different. It was mm -hmm. different in the sense that instead of being orange and silver, mm -hmm. it was uh, just like a silver metal appearance. Yeah. And not only that, but it had two bones, one of them on top of the object and one of them underneath it. But it looked sealed in metal. In other words, it, you didn't see no windows and no holes and nothing. No windows? No. Oh. You did not see any windows. It was just surface metal all the way around. I Almost see. like sheet metal formed into the shape of a, a disc with two domes. How one was, on top, one on the bottom. How was the, uh, the dome? Uh, was it uh, transparency? Or? No, it was solid metal solid. with the rest of the disc. And it was all colored silver with the sun shining off it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just beautiful silver like aluminum or sheet metal. Or, how did it fly? I don't know. I did not hear any noise. It was like, it was that, in that sense, it was like the other object because it made absolutely no noise. I mean, it would go up like this and come back like this. Come around like that. And just watching it was, you know, it was hard uh -huh. because when it would go that way, I'd run across the field and I'm trying to get it in a viewfinder. Mm -hmm. And I took about four or five shots like that. Uh -huh. And I believe two or three of them came out mm -hmm. and two came out in the sky. Well, in the course of the sighting, the object was going like this way, mm -hmm. and then it reversed course and went back that way until mm -hmm. it was like hiding behind some trees over there. Yeah. And I, I stopped and I thought for a moment it was going to be gone, but instead I saw an airplane coming uh -huh. this way. Uh -huh. And, you know, I saw it getting closer and closer. At the same time the airplane was halfway from those trees to where I was at, the object came from behind the trees to start to follow the airplane. Oh. So and the, the way the airplane was, the airplane was coming in like this, and the object was like, coming around like this. It started to come around like this, and instead it went back this way, and on these sides of the trees. Oh. And when, as the C-130 passed over me, I took a picture of it. And then I swung back. By that time, the object had gone back over here. Uh -huh. And then it started to go back. I took some more pictures of it, and then it came over me like this. And the sun was like this, reflected it was over this way. And when it did, the object, the object went straight up into the sun. And for a moment it was cast, the sunlight hit it, it took on a dark shape. Oh. And I got a picture of that. I did get a picture of that. And then the object looked like it went straight up into the sun. I mean, it just climbed, climbed, climbed into the sun. I stood, stood in the field, and shaking my head, trying to figure out why I was the one seeing all this, waiting for someone to pull over and get out and say, what the hell was that? Or, or you know, something like that effect. Uh -huh. you know, excuse my French, but the, I mean, that, that, that really, I didn't, I was just, and I was trying to think of what, first I want to guard the film, 
I was praying all my pictures came out because I knew I had some good pictures if they did come out. Right. But I think the military people. I'm did. positive they had to see it. I know for a fact that Air Force people did because it wasn't hid behind the trees where you couldn't see it. It was like, see that big tree? Uh -huh. It was like on right. the other side, they're just sitting there next to the tree. Just uh -huh. hovering right there. And when the, when the airplane came over and it came back, if the pilot saw me, I mean, imagine the pilot that low to the ground. Here's somebody standing there with a camera with the pictures of his aircraft. Right. I mean, he had to see me on the ground. And also, the radar men have known about it. Oh, I thought oh, it was radar. Right. The thing was, was 1,500. At one point, I'd say about 2,000 feet above the ground, two, 3,000. And from what I've talked to the radar people, they say the radar will pick up anything as low as 800 feet. You know, if they, if they find it at 1,500, they'll sweep the area and then come back and sweep it, and try to get the lowest sweep possible right, in order to right. get, detect the object on radar to get an echo phase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if that was able to happen, well, then obviously, obviously somebody over there saw it. Right. Right. Next day, I got a phone call from the uh, uh, Air Force base telling me to come out there and see a Captain King. Mm -hmm. He wanted, he was interested in seeing my photographs. So I went out to the Air Base with my daughter in the car and got in there and uh, got to the gate. And the guard didn't know what I was talking about. He said, well, Mr. Herman, it's 5.30 in the afternoon. Our information officer has been off duty since 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I said, well, somebody called me at 3.30 and told me to come out here by 5.30. And he said, well, wait right here. So I... Waiting, waiting, waiting. Finally, about 20 minutes later, uh, up drives his station wagon out, gets this uh, fellow in civilian clothes. Mm -hmm. Walks up to me and says, hello, I'm Wade King. What can I do for you? And I said, well, sir, uh, somebody from your office called me and said you were interested in seeing my photograph. He said, what photograph? I said, the photograph of the UFO I took. Mm -hmm. He looked at me and he says, wait, wait right here. So he went to the guard shack. Five minutes later, up walks the guard in uniform with a sidearm, puts his hand on the wind of the car and says, are you military? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, sir, I'm not. He looked at me like I was born yesterday, and he said, well, let me tell you this. He said, why don't you turn the photograph over to the captain and let him take it from here? Mm -hmm. to turn your, just turn the negatives in the photos over to the captain and let him take it from here. And I said well, uh, to myself, I said, I was not born yesterday. Mm -hmm. I said, listen, I'll compromise. I'll give you a photo, and you tell me what you want to do with it. Do what you want. Anything that you think you can help me find out what this is. He said, well, we'll certainly do that. Thank you so much. And he wrote his name on I.O. Bill Herman, one card, one photograph, you know. Uh -huh. And he handed me his card with that written on the back. I took it and I left. Thankful I was in the military. Mm -hmm. So I took these follow-ups back to the office, information office to uh -huh. get my photo back from the captain. The minute I walked in his office, he was bright, face cheery attitude. And got up and said, hello, Mr. Herman, how you doing? And I said, fine. Let me tell you, we, we put it through our information channels, and this is what they told us. You photographed an F-4 Phantom flying at 5,000 feet. That's what you photographed, Mr. Herman. But if you look here, pointing to that picture, he said, if you look here, you'll see the stabilizer and the back tail. And, and you can even, if you look close, you can see the exhaust. <laughs> and I, I didn't know what to do. So what did I do? I pulled out my blow-up, and I said, tell me something. I put them down in front of him, the same exact picture. And I said, does this look like? an F-4 Phantom to you, and he looked at it, and he kind of went like this, and he says, now listen, he says, if I was you, I just forget you saw it. I didn't know what to do, I didn't know what was going on. I certainly didn't, and last, as far as I knew, what I'd seen was a military project. I didn't believe it was from outer space or anything like that. I thought, well, man, you stumbled on a military project, and what proves it? The attitude of the Captain King. That's what proved it to me. Mm -hmm. You know, his attitude, his will, first of all, I just forget it. Mm -hmm. You know, why would he forget something that's flying in the confines of the Air Force Base and flying with so near a nuclear weapons facility and, and you know, in, in, in this degree? Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't know what to do. And finally, I didn't have an opportunity to take any more photographs, and I didn't know where I should, you know, as far how far I should get involved in this. You know, my father said, well, if it is government, you're going to find yourself in over your head, and they're going to do everything they can to discredit you, and they're going to hurt you, and you're not going to get, you got to thank your family and all this. I said, well, maybe I should.
I got a phone call about, I think it was 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon from a gentleman who identified himself as Tom Olson. He was in town from Riderwood, Maryland to investigate the UFO sightings and the earthquake phenomena in Charleston, which had been going on, oh, roughly uh, since October of 77. And he told me that he was here to investigate this. He was going to uh, take some photographs of the areas where all the UFO sightings had taken place, mm -hmm. and that he was going to uh, uh, make available to me copies of the information and his conclusions and findings. Mm -hmm. He talked with much authority, a great grasp of well, uh, my naive knowledge of the subject, and suggested, uh, could we meet? About 3.30, he arrived at the house. He had a, dri a Maryland driver's license with his picture on it, and then, and then he showed me a retired military ID card, and I believe it said United States Air Force, retired. Mm -hmm. And then he showed me uh, a Social Security card, and then a, what they call the UFO Information Retrieval Center mm -hmm. ID card, which was a long title, <laughs> you know, but still, you know, it was, oh yeah, with a picture and with a thumbprint on the front of it. Oh. Got in the car and had my pictures with me and I said, here, would you like to see the photographs? Because I, me, I was impressed with the photographs as far as here's something that shows I'm not hallucinating. Right. You know, what do you think it is? He brushed them aside and said, we'll look at those later. Tell me about your experience. I told him. I told mm -hmm. him about the earthquakes. I told him about seeing the object. I told him about the photograph in it. I told him about uh, all the people I've found it, who have seen it, the strange things affiliated with it in reaction to the uh, military aircraft over the field and cross-country road. He said, well, how did we get there? So we went there. And first we went to the Ferry, where the object hovered over the towers and moved in triangles. He took photographs. He took at least 40 pictures at each site. whole row of 35 millimeter film at each UFO site. He took one picture of me at the first site, and that's all the pictures he took of me. With darkness setting in, the men headed back to the car. In the afternoon, he said, Bill, let, let me tell you. He said, uh, what do you think about taking a polygraph test in, in relation to this? And I'm sitting in his car, and my first thought was, wait a minute, you haven't even seen my pictures. Why do you want to know this? You know, but I was afraid if I, I, I felt put on the spot. I was afraid if I said, no, I won't, then he'll just, you know, he'll go on, he'll go to the press and next thing I know, I'll be in the front page of the paper, big hope. You know? mm -hmm. Then I was afraid, well, if I said yes, it'll get twisted. I'll tell the truth, but they'll say I lied. And then it's their professional credentials against me. And I didn't know what to do, being naive, as I was, I had said, okay, I'll do it. Now, I assumed at that moment in time, he meant three weeks from now, a month from now, a couple days from now. He said, okay, we'll go to the hotel and do it right now. And we walked through the door, and I'd never been in the mill town. I was, fast, I was stunned by the beauty of the inside, the big chandelier and the beautiful furniture and the different adjoining rooms and the soft music playing in the background. And Mr. Olson, uh, he looked at me, he said, this is a nice place, isn't it? I didn't know where I was going, I was just following him. And my thought was, well, polygraph seems to me they've got to have a, a certain place they've got to operate it. And I was assuming there's got to be somebody else with him, but I haven't met them yet, and I don't, well, I don't like this. I don't understand what's going on here. You know, seems like there's something not right here. But I wasn't going to blow the whole thing and walk out and say, no, I don't want to do this now. And the elevator went to the fifth floor. We walked out of the elevator, walked up a little hallway in front of the elevator till we got to a big hallway. And we took a right, walked all the way down. It seemed like a long walk. And we turned right again, up another hallway, till we got to the last room down the hall. 
And the thing I didn't like about that room was it was separate from the rest of the room. It was like a little box closet. I heard him tap on the door twice. The knob turned. <laughs> I walk in the room and there's two other people in there. And one of them introduced himself as he kind of mumbled when he introduced him. He said, I'm Dr. Blah, blah, blah. I shook my hand. The other fellow says, no, I'm so-and-so with the uh, Ryder, Ryder Wood Maryland Polygraph Association or something about something like that. He said, well, sit over here. And it was like, looked like a flat machine. It looked like a briefcase almost. And when you open it up, it was like a polygraph. The polygraph machine itself. You know, there was all kinds of little wires running out of it. He did not ask me to sign anything, which I felt not that I wanted to sign anything, but something in writing to protect my rights. But even when that thought crossed my mind, I, I dismissed it. I was manifesting naiveness. I wasn't scared as much as I was. I don't like this. You didn't even tell me there were two other people here. You know, and I was wondering who were what was going on. But if this is the way they operate, well, maybe I'll just sort of go along with the die. But when the doctor, that guy who identified himself as a doctor, walked over to the bed, picked up a, brown, a black satch doctor bag, and pulled out a hypodermic needle and a little syringe, put them together, he then reached in the bag and pulled out, looks like a, a greenish liquid. Put it into the needle. He said, this is going to relax you. Now, I was scared. And I wasn't afraid I was going to die. I just didn't know what he was going to put in me. And I started, uh, my voice quivered. And I asked him, are you sure that won't hurt me? He said, no, 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 Joe, this isn't going to hurt me. And I rolled up my sleeve. And he punched me right here. And uh, I saw it go in me, and I sat there a minute, waiting for me to die, and I didn't die. And I, I sat there, and I felt very, very relaxed. Very relaxed. And he started asking me questions. Did you see a UFO? And I said, yes, I did. And the doctor marked, you know, the photograph I marked something. He asked me another question. When you saw the disc, did it change color? And I said, no, it didn't. Because it didn't. And he marked it, and it seemed like his hand moved slower that time. I didn't realize it, but I was getting sluggish. I was getting more relaxed. I didn't realize it. And he asked me the third time, and it wasn't like I was in a trance, but I was just totally relaxed. And then he asked me more questions. He would rephrase questions. Asked the same question and rephrase. Now this went on for, oh goodness, it seemed like an hour hour and a half, until finally he said, that's fine. And he put down the thing, set it down, and he said, okay, I'm hooking. And uh, I was drained of energy. I mean, I was literally, oh man, tired. He said, well, go in the bathroom, wipe your face off, put some water on your face, and you're right. It's over, don't worry. And I was in there and I did that, and they conferred for a moment. I didn't hear what they said. I could hear them mumbling to each other, and I didn't hear what they said, but I, because I had the door half shut. But the minute I came out, they all walked away from each other. Tom Olson said, okay, Bill, I bet you're starved. And I remember saying something about, no, not really, I'm more tired. So we left the room. Went downstairs, got out, got in the car. Says, uh, yeah, you sure? I'll be glad to take you anywhere. I hear they got good she crab soup at the trawler. And I said, no, 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 Tom, I'm, I'm, I'm about to drop. I'm tired. Take me home. He said, okay. He said, listen. He said, you'll be hearing from us for the results of the polygraph examination. He said, either way, you're going to hear it from us by at least Wednesday. So we drove home. We hardly said two words on the way. I was tired. I didn't. I didn't feel like asking anything. I pulled into the yard, and then I opened the door, the cold air hit me. And I was, uh, you know, cool air hit me, and I, I was, you know, refreshed for a moment. I said, tell me something, Tommy. I said, where do you think this thing is from? I mean, you know, it's military, ain't it? He said, who's military? And I said, our, our, I said, our military. And he said, uh, I wouldn't bet on it. And uh, the way he said that, I'll never forget it.
One week later, Bill received a memo from Tom Olson asking him to fill out a questionnaire and send copies of his photos to the office in Riderwood, Maryland. Shortly thereafter, a mailgram arrived from Tom Olson. The message thanked Bill for sending the material. It was friendly, but contained a disturbing reference, which read, I did not visit you. It was someone else, and I have no idea who. Signed, Thomas M. Olson, President, UFO Information Retrieval Center, Riderwood, Maryland. To this day, Tom Olson in Riderwood, Maryland, swears up and down he never seen me, and I believe him. I believe him with all my heart that this is not the same Tom Olson who lives in Riderwood, Maryland, right. and is a UFO Information Retrieval. Now, see, this guy didn't identify himself as president of the UFO Information Retrieval Center. He just is a member. The real Tom Olson is the president of the UFO Information yeah. Retrieval Center. Right. I haven't seen him before. Okay, see? And, that's, mm -hmm. and then, uh, you've uh, never seen that, uh, the fake, Tom Olsen? Yes, I saw him one time after that when I worked at J.C. Penney. Oh. It was late at night, about 9.30, and I was dumping the trash out and cleaning up where I worked at, at J.C. Penney Auto Center in Charlestown Square Mall. And I uh, opened the back door, and here's this car sitting back there. Oh. And I walk out of the door. The car just swings around, pulls up to the back, says, hello again. <laughs> and I looked in the car, and there's this guy, Tom Olson. Now, I had knew, knew that it, it, he was a fake. Mm -hmm. The first thing I did is I said, now, who are you? Why are you masquerading as someone else? And he looked at me like, uh, just brushed it off and said, it's for your own protection. You should know that. Or something to that extent. Oh. He said, you, you should be careful what you say and how deeply you get involved in these things. He just told me about being careful who I talk to. It's for my own good, for your own safety. Uh, we're watching, we're aware of everything and all this. And I told him to get out of here. And I said, I'm going to go call the cops. He kind of laughed. And I started to walk and get his license plate number from the back of the car. And I started walking toward him. The car backed up. I walked into that car, just backed up all the way and took off into the traffic. He got away so quick, I couldn't even see the back of the license number. I couldn't even get no numbers or letters or anything. Oh. So when I started to walk behind his car to get his license number, that's when he took off. And you never seen him? Never. I haven't never seen him face to face again. Uh, and what do you think? Uh, I think he's either CIA or the, uh, I think he's part of some conglomerate that looks into these things for the government off the record and, and does it solely to either confuse everyone really involved in it or to discredit any people who come into contact with you, I believe. Uh, I think that's his whole purpose, isn't it? To Not only had Bill and his family been targeted, but harassment was now being focused on the investigative team. Promoting the, the truth and the facts. After we spent a whole afternoon and an e evening interviewing like we did here this evening, mm -hmm. uh, and everybody had gone home and we went to bed about uh, 12 o'clock. It was pretty late at midnight, and I was just getting to sleep at 12.15, the telephone rang twice, mm -hmm. and it didn't ring again. So I picked up the phone, and nobody on it, and I thought, well, somebody's dialed wrong. Mm -hmm. So I went back to sleep, and it rang again twice, and I woke up, to, or was sleeping light enough, I heard both rings, and I thought, well, somebody is trying to call. I picked up the phone, and nobody on there, but the line wasn't closed either. The line was open. I could hear that. But nobody talking, nobody breathing, anything. So I hung it back up, and I dialed the desk downstairs, and I said, uh, did you call me? And he said, no. I said, did any calls come in for me? He says, no, there hasn't been any calls on the switchboard. It's 115. So I hung it back up, and I said, well, that's strange. And at 215, I got another two-ring call. Mm -hmm. And I picked up the phone, and I said, who is this? Nothing. Mm -hmm. The line is open. Nothing. So I called down to the desk again. I said, uh, is there any way that my phone can be rung? And he says, not unless it comes through this switchboard. I says, has anybody called? He said, no, no, no calls have come in. So I hung that up and I called John Fielding across the hall in his room. And I said, John, something funny is happening three times now at 15 minutes past the hour. I've got a two ring telephone call and nobody on the line. And the desk says it didn't come through the desk. He says, God, that's strange. He said, I've got been getting them too. He said, I got one at 12.15 and 1.15 and just a couple of minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And it went on at 3.15 and 4.15 and 5.15, the same thing. Both of us got them. They were trying to call. The only, the only, only one uh, uh, possibility is that uh, somebody who was staying in the hotel yeah. 
somebody right. staying in the hotel can ring the room number without going through the switch. Well, it goes through the switchboard, but it doesn't light it up. Could have been somebody picked up a phone in a hallway or, or in another room. Somebody in room. another room could dial my room and let it ring twice, but it would have to be deliberate now. Mm -hmm. It could, it would, first it could be accidental, but it's not accidental if you get it two rings each time. Mm -hmm. And it happened five times during the night at exactly 15 minutes past the hour, and there's nobody on the line. Mm -hmm. There's too many things there that it can't be coincidental anymore. It can't mm -hmm. be accidental. Right. And for two different rooms across the hall, the only ones that were being disturbed. Mm -hmm. So is that uh, a kind of uh, warning? That mean, I don't know what it was. I was talking with Harry Levelson over the phone long distance mm -hmm. in New York. I believe he was at Omni offices at that time. Or I don't know if he was at his home residence. But anyway, in the course of our conversation, there was this noise you know, duplicated this way. And, and the phone itself mm -hmm. in our conversation it didn't start the minute we took started talking, started when we started talking about the UFO. It was like, noise, just noise, just a click, 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 clack, click, clack, click, clack, click, click. Yeah. <laughs> and he says, what is that? And I says, I don't know what it is. And he says, well, listen. And so we listened some more. And finally he says, you know, I know what it is. Somebody listened in on us and now they're disturbing us. And we talked in spite of it, and it still kept on going, until mm -hmm. so it finally just stopped when we were talking. So I don't know what it was. Here's a, another strange thing. Harry Levelson came down to visit Bill, mm -hmm. and he made plans to come down with his girlfriend, telling nobody in the office where he was going on a weekend, and arriving quietly and unannounced. They arrived in Charleston, checked into the motel, and 15 minutes later got a telephone call from a lady uh, who said she worked for a television station, wanted to interview Levelson on his visit to Charleston. <laughs> uh, who do you think they right there? I know. Uh, this is not the first case that we have investigators mm -hmm. alleging that they are somebody else. False identification. It comes up quite frequently. I have got to believe anybody that is that well equipped and has that many apparently valid identification cards mm -hmm is coming from an agency, a covert agency, that is able to do all of these things and adequately finance. And I can only think of one that comes to mind right away, and that would be an intelligence organization. And the only intelligence organizations we have here are government. The investigators call a witness, a friend of Bill's from work who had similar sightings of the unusual object. As soon as we got here, we got a telephone call. <laughs> from uh, the, the so phone rang. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Melina answered it, and she turned and said, it's Tom Olson. He's called for you several times this afternoon. Mm -hmm. He wants your telephone number. He's at a pay station. So Tony took the telephone, and it turns out to be Tony's boss. They're calling from his work, right? Uh, to remind you again that Tom, Tom Olson called once more and wants to know if they can give the Tom Olson your number. Yes, he urgently wants my number. And he's at a pay station someplace and he wants to call back. Stevens has placed an inductive coil device on Tony's telephone, hoping to record Olson in the act of harassment. Tony places the call to the pay station number. Yes, is this payphone? No, sir, it's not. Do you know Mr. Tom Olson? No, sir, I don't. All right, thank you. Olson had managed to send an ominous warning. To the investigators, we know where you are and who you are talking to. We are watching and listening. To the Martins, we know where you are employed and where you live. If you value your job and your privacy, back off. Unshaken, the Martins agreed to the interview. We passed the King's Grand area on Dorchester Road, and you've got a column of, you know, it's like a wooded area. Mm -hmm. You've got woods on both sides of the road. And uh, it seems like it, it just hit us at the same time to look up. Now, my car, all the windows are tinted in my car. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I've got a band across the front windshield that is you know, blackened out, and you can only see at night. It's real hard to see out of any of the windows unless you see something that's coming right. directly in front of you. Okay, I'd say the object appeared um, at an altitude of probably about 500, no more than a thousand feet up, mm -hmm. is when I first saw it, and uh, it was anywhere from an eighth to a quarter mile in front of us. It came down, I'd say, at about a 70-degree angle. Okay, it came from an easterly direction, mm -hmm. came down, and uh, what I really noticed about that was strange. Bill said, look, he said it's doing triangular patterns. Mm -hmm. That's what it was doing. It was a glowing object doing triangular patterns through the sky. It came down at about a 70-degree angle. It made a loop, mm -hmm. you know, probably about, I'd say about 100 feet above treetop level. Yeah. Came down, made a loop, and went back up at the same at the same type angle. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really strange that that you know they would come down and they could only be seen directly in front of us. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I didn't think there was any mistaking uh, you know, of it being the object because of what he had told me about the object doing triangles and patterns. Mm -hmm. So we saw that we went a little bit farther down Dorchester Road. And uh, we turned to another subdivision called Forest Hill. We went back in that area, and uh, you've got the Ashley River area. It's marshy. Right. We went behind a house there, and we just stood around. You know, he just had an impulse to turn there. We went back there, and we stood around. And uh, it was like like someone cut on a light bulb on the far distance. Just saw a bright flash, and then went back out. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I thought about it. It could have been an object, it may not have been. Um, I took into account quite a few different things. I noticed that um, just prior to seeing the object, we had a C-141 fly overhead. Uh -huh. and it was heading towards the base. You know, you can you could tell um, the size of it, uh, the lighting, you know, things like that. You, you can usually tell, mm -hmm. you know, what type of object right. you have in the sky. I've been around military objects for, mm -hmm. for quite a period of time. Um, I've lived on military installations all my life. I've, I've seen, you know, what flies and what doesn't, <laughs> and I've never seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. Tony would answer a nagging question that had eluded the investigators. How long had the Charleston area been undergoing UFO activity prior to 77 and 78? I had my first sightings back in 1973 mm -hmm. while I lived on Charleston Air Force Base. Uh, we had a flap that lasted for about a period of a week. We had numerous sightings. Uh, they were multiple sightings where you had uh, three to, I would say, up to nine crafts in, in that area, uh, mainly over the Charleston uh, River Basin. Yeah. Uh, it was a circular type object that had a dome on top. Uh, it had lights that were revolving in a counterclockwise rotation. I can even remember, uh, um, I think it was a football game uh, that they had on the base. And, you know, I don't know how true this is. I heard it from quite a few different people. Mm -hmm. They said a saucer-shaped object came over the football field, hovered above the game for a period of five or ten seconds, and then just shot off towards the Astro River area again. When was that? This was uh, right back, I guess it was during 73, 74, oh, right around that same same period of time. I and when we were having quite a few UFO sightings in the area. Which area is here most? Frequently, you have observed you. Okay, it's it's always been associated right around the Assi River area, mm -hmm. from um, Somerville, I'd say, up as far as um, the end of Dorchester Road. So it seems like most of the sightings are, are associated right around uh, a military type installation and also around around the Assi River area. Yeah, there have been numerous sightings, um, particularly right around in this area. In, uh, you had the Barnwell Nuclear Plant, uh, Naval Weapons Station, uh, the Navy Base, and quite a few right around the Air Force Base. So it, it, it seems like whoever or whatever um, we're dealing with, they, they tend to you know, want to know something about our military. Is there any possibility that... Uh, Janichi asked Tony if there's a possibility that the objects being seen could be a secret military project. Of course, you have to take that into consideration. That it could be something like that, but um, 
unless our technology has really advanced beyond the point that I think it has, mm -hmm. uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily consider it to be so. Uh, I would I would tend to rather think that it is something of of either an extraterrestrial type nature or something that's totally unknown to us. Knowing that they are under physical surveillance, and possibly electronic surveillance, Stevens calls the next witness from a safe phone. In December 1977, I was returning from lunch back to my office. It was about 1.30 in the afternoon, clear sky. And up Rivers Avenue, um, as I was approaching a viaduct, I noticed a glowing orange type object off to the left of the car, I would estimate possibly 3,000 feet away, but it was very clear and it apparently was motionless and I could see no wings of any type, no rotaries, as though it could have been a helicopter. And I noticed that at least one person in another car pointing to it, which indicated to me someone else had seen it. Uh, as I approached the viaduct, and began going up, there was a traffic light, and I had to stop for that traffic light, and I noticed that the object was descending in the same direction, apparently, that I was going, at a slow rate, mm -hmm. and I thought possibly it was a kite of some type, because it, it, it defied the obvious laws of gravity, and there was no mm -hmm. sound. And as I began moving forward after the traffic light, I noticed that the object had disappeared beyond some pine trees which were to my left and I looked straight ahead and I could see the object currently crossing Rivers Avenue beyond that sign at a, a good distance away but it was at an angle I could tell it was a disc shaped object it had the definite orange color and it apparently was was moving with uh, with no wings or no uh, rotors as a helicopter would mm -hmm. it was not a bird it was very very clear and at one time, I did also observe a C-141 airplane at the same time that I saw the object. You've seen the object more than once? No, I've seen it one oh. time, but it was during the, the first time that I saw it, first mm -hmm. glanced at it, way beyond the object was a C-141, apparently coming towards the Charleston Air Force Base. Yeah, I, I was going to say the description you just gave of Rivers Avenue and the viaduct and looking and going towards the trees positions the object in roughly in the vicinity of Charleston Air Force Base or just to the east of the base? Just to the east. And you saw a C-141 in the air, either in the traffic pattern or landing, which would confirm that. Right. So the object was operating within the landing traffic pattern of Charleston Air Force Base, if we're guessing right. That's right. I would estimate that possibly the object was, I would say, between myself and the Cooper River, which is the, the Navy Yard facility. Uh, it would be difficult to say exactly how far. From your perspective, uh, could you form any kind of an estimate of its size, its diameter? I would estimate between, say, 25 and 30, say 25 to 35 feet mm -hmm. in uh, diameter. Do you think the C-141 noticed that uh, the UFO itself at that time? It would be difficult for me to, yeah. to think that the C-141 would not have noticed it. Mm -hmm because it was in the sky and bright, bright. Purcell had observed the same type of object playing cat and mouse with a C-141 three weeks before Herman had taken his spectacular photographs of the object on the tail of the C-141. So when I came back to my office, I told my staff that I'd apparently seen a UFO and of course they chuckled. I yeah. thought I was, you know, had a couple for lunch. <laughs> I assure you I had not. Uh, I called several TV and radio stations to ask if anyone else had seen an object or reported it, and none said that they hadn't received any calls. How receptive were they to a report of a UFO? Were they interested in what you told them? Not or? really. The North Charleston Police Department said I could come down and fill out a report if I chose to do it, and that's as far as it got. The Air Force Base said they had no record of any sightings. The interview had been completed without any outside interference. They would continue to use safe phones to arrange meetings with potential witnesses. Stevens had turned up a new witness who claimed to have a series of remarkable photographs, but he was reluctant to go on camera, fearing
fearing that this might compromise the privacy and security of himself and his friend, a noted television and radio columnist who took the photographs. After a lengthy discussion, Janici assures the witness that his identity will be cloaked. You want to see these things? Yeah. This is those pictures were taken, some by the gentleman you're talking about and some by his mother, were they not? Uh, just by him. By him just and his wife. Him. I don't know which one of took. His mother was, I think, his or her mother was kind of old and she didn't have any photography stuff. Uh, did they ever see the spacecraft on or near the ground? Well, just right These over the house. People, just over the house. Yeah, just flying. You know, there's a lot of pictures here. Uh, as far as I know, uh, no one has ever seen these photographs except for the people I've described. Here's like this one's flying directly over the house. Mm -hmm. Right over the house. Right over the house. Here's the, here it is with the top of the capsule raised. He said that capsule went up and down on top. Changed elevation. Sometimes yeah. it was higher and sometimes... Well, you can see in this one, it, there's no top to the thing. This is going over the house also. This is the same photograph, but it was further over the house. See this going over the house? Uh -huh. and he took another picture as it got over the house. That's interesting. And then as it went out in the field, it elevated this little thing on top of bubble on top. That accounts for some of the changing shapes that we get reported. I see. And here's one again in the open field, uh, just over a cornfield, way out over the trees. He said the motion picture is extremely good. He said they were oh, really good. Yeah, I that. Right. Because he got it going over the really? house and in the woods and out in the field and all that kind of stuff. Said they were tremendous pictures. Is that, uh, it, is that a, anyway we, we could get? Could you give us the telephone number again and uh, let us uh, call and introduce? I him won't unless I unless I call him. I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. Uh, we'll pay for the call if you call him and ask him if he will talk to us. We'll we'll give him a control name. We we won't reveal his identity or location. We can promise all of those things and give proof of it. These are just photographs that you can take pictures of. Uh, yeah. And, uh, like this is one that's going into the trees and going a little further and so on and so forth. And because of his wife, I don't feel like um, he'll ever do anything as long as he's living. Mm -hmm. Because she is still terrified. Yeah. Totally. And there's a very nice people. And they're, um, they're very rich people. Okay, so it wasn't a case where they couldn't protect herself with money or anything. They could, but they did not seem to bother. They, they're still yeah. scared. He said, and eventually, uh, these people are going to contact you. He says, if you start this thing up, they're going to contact you. He says, and I know what I'm talking about. I've talked to other people who've been through this thing. He says, that's the reason we're totally silent. He says, so if you want all the publicity and all the headaches you can ever get, you start revealing this. And I, now I don't know whether I should listen or not. For every witness that had been frightened off, there were others who would willingly come forward to share the wonder of their experience, like the Jerry McAllister family in Anderson, South Carolina. Well, approximately 4.20 in the morning, I was awakened uh, by sound. I thought it was a helicopter crashing here in the backyard. And, uh, I woke up and uh, the whole entire uh, inside of my house was lit up real bright, and outside real bright. So I finally got to the window, in the bedroom window, and looked out and uh, didn't see a, any crash of a helicopter. First thing I seen was this uh, most perfect flying saucer you had ever seen. And uh, I never believed in them, but uh, I've seen that one. Uh, I believe in them now. But uh, it was over the whole structure of these pine trees here. Where? Uh, about here in this, it's about 70 foot in circumference, approximately two stories high. I viewed it for approximately three minutes. But I, uh, in turn, I, I had a broke leg, and uh, I grabbed one of my crutches and finally hit my wife in the leg and got her awake, and then she got to the window, and uh, she said, oh, my oh my gosh, I'm beautiful. And so it was sitting there uh, hovering over these pine trees, and as it was hovering over the trees, it was still uh, floating, this uh, up and down motion, clockwise, just like that. Uh, and when it got ready to leave, it just turned up, tipped up on edge, and just went off like a streak of light. The saucer landed uh, in his front yard, came down in his front yard. Uh, they went to his house, and mm -hmm. he drew this sketch. Yeah. And uh, about an hour and a half later, the Easley Sheriff's Department called me and asked, could they come down and uh, me draw a sketch of the saucer that was here in the backyard? Mm -hmm. I said, sure. So they came down, across an hour and a half. I drew this sketch here of the saucer. Yeah. And not even seeing this. 
they mm -hmm. I, I drew mine they compared it and you see how close they are right uh and uh, they didn't even uh i didn't even know if they had a sketch we, had, we didn't, know oh, else had seen it didn't even know anyone else had seen it the ufo bore a striking resemblance to the object film earlier by the television columnist there were 17 people in all 17 mm -hmm. people gathered here counting the, 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 the deputy, deputy sheriff four deputy sheriffs and our family and those neighbors and, and next door neighbors there's 17 people in all so, as daybreak came at five after seven that's when it got up yonder real high and it was still bright and then all of a sudden it left and it was cloudy like oh yeah just, just in this bit. area just in this area about through there from now, where it left it, it was as cloudy as it could be just like he's coming up a you know, rainstorm. Mm -hmm. Was there any odor or smell no. of any kind? No smell, no odor, no smoke. These trees, nothing moved when it was there or when it left. Wow. Everything was perfect. Mm -hmm. I could see windows, but the windows were black. Black. It was just all white, and the windows was blacked out. Uh -huh. It looked like. Have you seen the UFO before? No. Have you heard of that story? Uh, yeah, I read magazines all the time. Well, you're interested in She is. Yeah. She's the only one that's ever believed in them or liked to read about them. And my sister, she reads about them and she loves it. And she believes in it. We'd make fun of her. And she would give Nancy her books, you know. But the UFO magazine. Uh -huh. And I would give it to me after she finished with them. And I'd read them. I'd say, Mama, look at this. And she goes, Oh, I'm fooled out. I don't believe that stuff. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. How about you, yourself? You. This was the first time. Uh, I see. And before then, the, the I didn't believe, believe in it. No. So. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> no, I didn't believe in it. Like I tell you, I don't. I didn't believe they even sent me into the moon. I just, just, I just didn't ever could get it in my mind and believe that mess. <laughs> but uh, I believe it now. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this saucer here, uh, I definitely, I don't. It didn't come from the United States. We uh we we brilliant, but I don't believe we that brilliant to have something that beautiful. Not that not a structure like like this was. Mm -hmm. uh, I I believe it comes from another planet. Still agreed to undergo hypnotic regression to fill in four hours of missing time. Hopefully, this would answer his haunting questions: Who are they? What are they? Where are they from? It would take almost four minutes to get him under. What happened, Bill? So the object. What object did you see? The disc. I saw it moving. Pointed it up to my wife. Just relax, relax. Stay where you are. Keep the program where it is. Just relax. You're unaware of any sound other than my voice. It's moving over the towers. I can see it. Patty, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a better look at this. I'll be right back. I better call Larry. Larry, it's back over the area. Right now, yes. Yes. I'm going out there now. You try to get on the other side. Okay. Bye. I'll be right back. What's happening, Bill? It's moving over the towers. I can see it. It's about... I don't know about... Thousand feet above the towers. It's moving in triangles. I can't. Uh, what the? Uh, I'm gonna break my neck. 
shoes and lying down. I get hit by a train? Wait, no. Okay. No, that can't be. No. Wait a minute. What do you see, Bill? Oh my. The lights are slowing down. They're flashing. On the ceiling, there's a light. Yeah. They're bald. Wait a minute. They're not bald, that's just the way they look. They're dressed alike. What are they wearing? They're wearing some kind of suit. Some kind of leotards of some sort. Um, are they humanoid? The backs are to me. They're looking at the light on the ceiling. They're looking at the... Looking at my foot. No, they're not looking at my foot. They're looking at the box. There's a box. I can't move my arms. I want to sit up, but I can't. My clothes are on, but my my coat's undone. My shirt's undone. Is anything attached to you? It's cold. Some kind of some kind of metal box. Flat metal box. It's cold, but it's not like water. Where is the flat metal box? It's on my chest. They're looking at me. Oh, God. What's oh. wrong? It's okay. What do they look like? 
like uh, fetuses. Like what? Fetus. A fetus? Yeah. A grown fetus. Wait a minute. The light, that's what it is. It's the light in the room that makes them look that way. Look closely. That's strange. What strange girl? The eyes. Brown. It's dark, black, brown. It's just a circle right in the socket. Wizard. How can, I, how can you breathe with little nose? They have a mouth. It's a slit. A straight line. No lips are. No lips. It's weird. Do they talk through their mouth? I didn't hear no talk. Where are you from? Who are you? Answer me for God's sake. Yes, it was broken once. What was broken now? When I was younger. I fell off a sliding bar and broke it. What was broken then? My arm. Who asked you? He asked me. He who? The one on my left. He asked me. How did he ask you? I don't know, but I, I heard him. Did he use his mouth? Says, How can you talk in his lips? Where are you from? What I remember is the pain. It was intense. It hurt. Bill, Bill, stay where you are. I want you to tell me the questions they asked you when you answered. Do you understand? Concentrate on what it was like. Be still and concentrate. Very well. He's moving a box off my arm. You can tell my arm is broken by looking at the box. For goodness sakes, that was so long ago. Legs. Did you see their hands? Yes. How many fingers did they have? They're all the same size. Lengthwise, they have four fingers. And it looks like a thumb, but it's the same size as the fingers. So that's a total of what? Five. Yes, five. Okay. All right, now you're... Go ahead. 
hand is weird. Why is it weird? You can't see any creases or knuckles. Though. There's no kind of... It almost looks like they're rubbery. Almost flexible. Can they manipulate them very well? They seem to be stationary. They're stationary? I mean, they don't bend them. When they bend them, they bend the whole hand. All right, Bill, let's go from... You can't even be four feet tall. How tall? Four, four and a half feet. They can't even be that tall. My goodness, this small. Look at this. Like marshmallow. He touched me. It's, you can you can tell there's bone under there. But you can't tell. It's weird. Grief. What color are they? Very pale, very milky. Is it a skin like texture? Tough skin. Everything's the same. No hair, no pores, just skin. It's weird. How did you feel when this being touched you? He was very, very peaceful. Like I had nothing to worry about. All right, now what happens? We're walking. We're going toward the door. The room is weird. It's different. Range. There's no creases, no borders, and it, the door is smaller than the back of the room. It's weird. It's distorted. Why? In what way is it distorted? I can't. This is it's like everything is molded into a shape. And it doesn't stop, it just goes straight out the door. Just mold it. Like, like a bathroom tub. Yeah, just seamless. Mold it. Just mold it. All I can think Go ahead. We're walking, we turn, we turn left. The one who talked to me is standing beside me. The other two are behind us. We're walking down the hall. We pass the room. The door is open. We go to another room. We go in it. The hall it winds in a circle. Everything is the same color. You said the hall wound in a circle. Did it wind in a circle up and down? Just both directions is a circle. It's hard to relate it. Did you traverse that? Everything's molded the same way. Council control center. Council control control See? center? Cons council. Console. Cons yeah. Console? Yeah, that's what he said. Console. Control center. All the network craft are controlled from similar centers. Network craft? It's the term. What? What? What did he get... say? He said they manipulate gravity. 
Now they manipulate the equilibrium in the ground. How? Did you ask him? In hydrodynamics, in reverse osmosis, a technique of reverse osmosis. They've been doing this roughly 50 years. uncomprehendable for me to understand. Why are they telling me this? Bill, let me ask you a question. Did they at any time promise you or uh, tell you that you in any way would remain in contact with them? Speak it. He said that they have means to contact those they wish to contact. He said we will meet again. Did he say when? No. All right, you're back in the console control room. Now what happens? The light on the, the checkerboard is flashing on and off. First red, then white, then red, then white. And those balls to the left and right are spinning. One sitting at the desk, the one who spoke to me said that I couldn't go and look. And I walk, and when I do, the one sitting at the desk I get up and step back. What happens? They step back. And when I move away from their desk, they sit down. Did any of them at any time touch you other than the uh, one who helped you from the table? No. You look familiar. You're in control center now, yeah. where the lights flash red and white and oh, red and yes, white. Yes, yes. Yes, he's motioning me around the room. I'm looking, everything looks funny little writing on the corner of every block and it looks like squiggles lines can you read it no it's, it's different all right Bill. i'll tell you what i want you to do now i would like very much for you to move your time to the point where they release you just a few minutes right before they release you. Now what happens? We're walking down the hall. We've left the down the place where the propulsion was. We got the, the big round balls. We went in a little closet, some kind of little room. We walk back up like a diagonal hallway into a little closet and the door behind us shuts and the one in front of us opens but when you step into it you don't see no door it's, it's like this seamless or something it's just you can't even tell it's there until it opens the uh one tells me that the time has arrived something about the time has arrived that they're sorry for the stress that's going to result from our release. But those sympathetic to 
my experience will help, although the majority will reject it. They say we're, we're going to meet again. That's what he said, we're going, we will meet again. He motioned me on the table, and the minute I touch the table, the light on the ceiling starts to flash. First slowly, and then fast. And as I lay down, they step back from the table. Did they place any restraints on you? I just lay on the table. The other one, he walks to the table. And he keeps putting the binoculars around my neck. He must have had the binoculars the entire time. The light's flashing and they're standing there. You're looking at a television set. You're looking at a television set. You're watching this on a television set. You are watching this story on a television set. Look at the television set. Look at the television set. Describe what's happening on the television set. The object is leaving. It's going up. How did that thing move? It's going triangle. There it is again. You're watching it on a television set? It's going to the left. You're all right. Oh my God, where am I? Where's the tracks? Where's... Oh God, Daddy! Bill, look at the television set. Look at the picture on the television set. Now look at the picture on the television set. Look! Look at the picture on the television set. You are calm. You are watching a rerun. You are watching a rerun. You are calm. Now describe to me what you are watching. You experience no panic, but you see in great detail. You are watching a picture. I got to get back to that yellow, that orange, that yellowish orange mark. It's the only place I'm safe. What's that? I hear something. There's nothing there. The object's gone. Where am I? Yes, I can't get your head on straight. Height nor death nor soul can reach there. Separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God, get a hold of yourself. Relax. Yeah. Relax. It's over with Bill. Bill, look at the picture on the television set. You are watching a rerun of what happened to you. You have already experienced those emotions. You don't have to do it again. Okay. You don't have to experience panic again. Car. There it goes. I gotta get out there. 
Do you want to go or don't I? I'm going. It's now or never. I'll be here forever if I don't move. Lord, give me strength. I'm going now. I'm running. Tearing through the bush. Stairs. I'm on a road. Oh, thank glory to the road. Street. There. There. Yes. Hey. It's a car come. It's a car come. Hey. Hey. Stop. Stop. Thank God you're here. No, it wasn't a car accident. Please get help. Where am I? No, it wasn't a plane accident. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Please. Get a policeman. Thank you. I don't mean to scare you. Please get a policeman. Get help, please. Oh, thank God. What if they don't come back? What if they don't come back? Stop! Another car. Stop! Yeah! Stop! Stop! Yes. Thank you. You're a policeman. Yes, yeah, right. No, no, no. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Just get a policeman. Call him, please. Thank you. Two people can't distract me. Yes? They're back. Yes, they're back. My name is Bill Herman. What time is it? Where? It can't be. Just a minute ago, it was 9.30. Where am I? Part of Charles. What? Wait a minute. That means, oh my God. I can't be. I don't know. I was standing in Charleston at 9.30. I saw a light in the sky. It, it dropped to the river. I saw... Eric, I'm a, who is, yes, thank you, thank you. Herman, call my wife, please, thank you. I just expected the worst, I didn't know what to believe, and he said he'd been in his yard in North Charleston, which is about 15 miles from here, and next thing he knew, he was here in this field near Somerville, right out in, right in the middle of the field is where he said he came to. He doesn't really remember too much what had happened that night. But they'd been watching a bright light that kept getting closer and closer. And the next thing he knew, he was here in this field and he told me he believed he'd been brought here by a UFO. Listen to me, Bill. And, uh, Bill, you're floating now. You're back in the present and you're asleep. You feel very good and very relaxed. How are you? Oh, I feel like I just slept for an hour. It feels so good. Yeah. I'm glad you did. The session had formed a bridge from illusion back to reality, allowing Janichi to probe for more information. He asked Bill what had frightened him the most. I can recall. To you, scary thing? Mm -hmm. Scary yeah, right thing? Yeah. I guess was the uh, disorientation when I was released, mm -hmm. you know, trying to comprehend where I am. I don't understand why they released me there. Why didn't they release me where I was picked up? A concern of Janichi's was how would Bill cope with the reality of the experience? I, I can't deal with this for the rest of my life. I, I, don't, I don't know what to, uh, 
you know, I don't, it's, it's, in a way it strengthened my marriage, in a way it's torn my marriage apart, mm -hmm. in a way it's uh, gotten to the point where it's not so much an obsession with me as it is a preoccupation. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if I saw the object again, I'm naturally going to be inquisitive, but I don't know what to, uh, you don't know what they think. Right. Uh, and I, <laughs> I, yeah. You know, I don't know what, you know, it seems like with all this information and all this in relation, things that, you know, I don't want to get into a position where there's positive deception on their part towards me. I don't want to be used as some mm -hmm. leverage. Yeah, like there would be more sessions and more answers to troubling questions, beginning with, why did the objects perform triangular flight patterns? The, the reason why they are moving. moving the reason, so yeah, I, I thought I got over that. Is the reason that they fly in these triangles or they perform these erratic movements mm -hmm. is because radar can lock on them, interferes with their propulsion somehow. I don't know the mechanics of it. So that they, would explain in one small area why the radar doesn't lock on these mm -hmm. things because of their movement. It, they come up the river and they're flying level and then they just crease up and the higher they get the more starting this thing they do mm -hmm. but they seem inside the object to be able to stabilize everything inside so it doesn't tear itself apart like a jet would if it started doing these acrobatics Janichi asked if any of the objects had crashed due to radar lock on back, I believe this is back in the uh, 60s or 50s mm -hmm. that radar had interfered with the propulsion of one of their uh, network vehicles, and that the object itself um, had to make a, a what he termed an impact landing or a crash landing. Literally, they lost one of their objects, and, uh, and not just the object, but the occupants on board were lost as well. He said government authorities uh, and got the, the craft itself, the occupants. As a result of that crash, they tried to make contact with the government, open contact, but it was suppressed. Way he said it, and it's maintained suppressed by whom to the I don't know, but mm -hmm. the way he said it, Earth governmental powers, mm -hmm. and that it was maintained suppressed, and uh, they're just you know, in the future when the threat of abuse can be removed, then they'll try it again. When will it be? I don't know. I do know that they said that the uh, uh, objects would be continuing to be sighted, sightings would increase. People would observe them in action, and that this was going, this was going on. It was going to keep going on. They have gone the route of selecting different people in the populace and revealing themselves to them, I guess, and and trying to establish awareness of their presence by doing that. How did they contact you? Janichi asked Bill, "Why was he contacted?" Mm -hmm. It seems to be that they start out, you know, just normal sightings. Mm -hmm. And if the person indicates a willingness of some sort, then they'll return. Mm -hmm. They said they have means to notify those they wish to notify. They told me that the field where I was released, someone else had been released in that field. I've been searching for who that person could be. Oh, I don't know. The investigation would wind down, even though Bill continued to search for clues into his past. After I recall what happened the first time in March, uh, I was told by the occupants that they consist of a network of these objects that are operating uh, around the world in uh, Presently, in the continental western hemisphere, is the way they worded it, and they're fr uh, from a cluster of stars 32 uh, light years away, uh, area in, in what we call a reticuli, mm -hmm. uh, galaxy, so the reticulum, and that they were uh, stellar astronomers, mm -hmm. or that was their whole, that was their whole civilization. That's what they were geared to: stellar astronomy and life and study of life all across galaxies and that they are uh, a network sent here to initiate what they call direct observances and they conduct inter how do you say inter atmospheric flight 
and uh, direct observance of people. What they do is they examine they see the uh, geographical spectrum. They examine the uh, experiments that they conduct in what he calls overt osmosis and hydrodynamics. They conduct a lot of experiments over water. They conduct experiments in aeronomy and geodesy. See, these were things that came out after I was uh, Dr. Harder uh, helped me a great deal by breaking that block that like I couldn't remember. No matter what I tried, I couldn't remember. But when I did remember, the, uh, it was like a, just like a, a water pipe that's busted in the water just with kids turn it over and turn it over. background, like almost like a like combat lights in a military ship, like a dark room red light. The emotion was that way, that I felt like I was an ant and they were a human standing next to me. I felt afraid because I know what was going on. I felt like this is totally foreign to everything I believe. All my emotions and fears were just tossed aside by the comfort and assurance of what he said to me. Just don't be afraid. I heard the voice, but I did not see the lips move. I heard it as clear as you hear my voice. In English, I was in English. It was a little symbol, uh -huh. it looked like a, a, a serpent with wings, like a, a half fish and half snake. And it was like it was the most strange, eerie sensation when he touched me. It was like I knew him from somewhere, and I couldn't place it. It was like, wow, this is like a buddy you knew when you was growing up. Suddenly, here he is again. I towered over him. I mean, they were smaller than me. I could have tossed them aside with a good, a good right hook, but I didn't feel threatened that bad. And the feeling was so soft and gentle, and yet at the source of that gentleness and the source of that softness, there was total control, total control of the situation around me. C-130 turboprop would come up and down the river, just fly up and down the river. All I kept thinking, wow, man, I never, I don't believe this. Because, you know, one of the uh, feelings in my mind, in my thoughts, was, you know, when you see something, it seems distant. In other words, removed from you personally. Mm -hmm. But this thing reacted personally. In other words, it 
not only were we watching it, but it by proving by coming toward us, it was watching us mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Not just performing the delight of us, but it seemed to react to our personal presence, and it reacted by coming toward us. And of course, it frightened us because I never saw it that close. Yeah. And, we, and we left. After the frightening experience, Patty's fear would overcome her curiosity. She would beg Bill to please leave well enough alone. He would agree until three weeks later on a Sunday morning. Patty was home, I believe. Yeah, our daughter was sick and she couldn't go to church. So I got in my car to go to church. And I'm driving down Dorchester Road. And since that last Friday, and I had kept my camera in my car fully so loaded. I wasn't thinking about UFOs. In fact, I was listening to some hymns on the radio, Christian hymns. Just minding my own business when this thing shoots across the road. Silver, with a halo of light on the bottom. It's the most pretty thing I ever saw. At first it was silver, pure silver, and then it just changed like somebody got a red stat in a dining room and turned it. And bright, dim. This thing was gone. Up, this way, and back, this way, and back, this way. And Getting so precise in its movement, that's where I connected, determined my mind, triangular pattern, because it went up like a triangle, mm -hmm. and then skid up and down this way, and I don't know the purpose of it, maybe to attract my attention, I don't know. <laughs> the triangular flight patterns would remain a mystery, and although the photographs were good, they would pale in comparison to those he would take later. As the investigative team neared the location where Bill took his dramatic new series, Stevens became concerned. We would be filming near a strategic U.S. Air Force base, and I was concerned that this might cause problems for all of us. As a retired lieutenant colonel with the U.S. Air Force, I knew that the military could be unpredictable at times, especially when you have a foreign film team operating on the edge of a restricted flight line. And we were here investigating an unidentified flying object, a UFO, that was intruding in military airspace. Yes, I was concerned. the object come up, my wife and I, we saw the object coming up this way, yeah. up the river, and it was about maybe 900,000 feet above the water, mm -hmm. just a disk of uh, whitish light, mm -hmm. and then it kind of rapidly gained altitude going up at an apex of mm -hmm. a triangle, if you don't understand, mm -hmm. and uh, then we lost sight of it for a moment, we were both standing outside the car, all of a sudden, right over this area, the big light, it's the light that was coming straight for us. Our car is parked over that direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got frightened. My wife got frightened very much. And uh, we just left. We just, I turned the car, jumped in the car and turned the car on and started to speed out. And the, uh, looking in the rear view mirror, I saw the light look like it reversed its course and oh. started going back toward the river. In other words, in other words, when we close. right when we left, uh -huh. when we you know when, when we were gone, the object came toward our car, uh -huh. and then it like it changed its mind or dropped following us, uh -huh. and it just went back the opposite direction. Uh -huh. How big was it when it came close to you? Oh man, the lights were that huge, big, big old spotlights like there were spotlights coming straight for us, uh -huh. and my wife was particularly terrified because you know we didn't know what. What was, we didn't know what was going on. Uh, uh, she said, let's get out of here. And <laughs> we left, man. We just, we've gone. Uh, have you seen the detail of the UFO itself or just like? 
Well, you could see a shape behind the lighting. Oh yeah. And when it looked like my, like a dull metal finish, mm -hmm. and the lighting itself kind of, the so more more of the lighting stood out than the detail of the object. But the object was, it looked metallic, you know, like a metallic skin, but the light in the front of the object. How was the distance between yours and the Oh, uh, if, if, if I'd have had a camera or a rock or anything, I could have thrown it and just hit the bottom of it. That's how close it got to the car. And I, you know, it was just a matter of seconds. I mean, if we hadn't gone and we did, there's no way the object couldn't have intercepted our car. Uh -huh. I'm, le I'm very convinced if it wanted to catch us, it could have. Uh -huh. You know, because it seemed to be moving that fast coming up from the river. Was it before your abduction? Yes, it was. Before? It was before so the abduction. Was it... Uh, I was with my wife and my daughter, so I didn't know... You know, I didn't want to take any kind of chances on anything. Mm -hmm. So I, we, we, we just left. Oh, so you should be very frightened. That particular reason we were. Because <laughs> all the other sightings were just simply watching something moving in the sky and never uh -huh. anything coming close that close to us. I guess I should have looked down the road then, but I, I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. I was, up to that time, I was convinced what I saw was a military project. I never believed it was from another world or anything. I thought I'd, since the area is in such close proximity to the Air Force Base, because like this area is a flight landing pattern for commercial mm -hmm. aircraft mm -hmm. and sometimes military aircraft. And the, uh, you know, that's my, that was my thoughts back then. Noticing that Bill is near emotional trauma, Junichi quickly changes the subject. And then most of the sightings afterwards, one of those, yeah. and the sun was like this, as much as it was over this way. And when it did, the object, the object was straight up into the sun. And for a moment it was cast, the sunlight hit it, it took on a dark shape. And I got a picture of that. someone to pull over and get out and say, what the hell was that? Or, or you know, something like that effect. You uh -huh. know? Excuse my French, but the, I mean, that, that, that really, I didn't, I was just, and I was trying to think of what, first I want to guard the film, and I was praying all my pictures came out, because I knew I had some good pictures if they did come out. Right. What do you think the military people? I'm positive they had to see it. I know for a fact that Air Force people did, because it wasn't, hid behind the trees where you couldn't see it. It was like, see that big tree? Uh -huh. It was like on right. the other side, it was just sitting there next to the tree. Just uh -huh. hovering right there. And when the when the airplane came over and it came back, if the pilot saw me, I mean, imagine the pilot that low to the ground. Here's somebody sitting there with a camera with pictures of his aircraft. Right. I mean, he had to see me on the ground. Right. And also, the radar men have known about it. Oh, I thought it was the radar. The thing was, was 1,500, at one point I'd say about 2,000 feet above the ground, two, 3,000. And from what I've talked to radar people, they say the radar can pick up anything as low as 800 feet. You know, if they, if they find it at 1,500, they'll sweep the area and then come back and sweep it, try to get the lowest sweep possible right, in order to right. get, detect the object on radar to get an echo mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if that was able to happen, well then obviously, obviously somebody over there saw right. something. The next day, I got a phone call from the uh, uh, Air Force base telling me to come out there and see a Captain King. Mm -hmm. He wanted, he was interested in seeing my photographs. So I went out to the Air Base with my daughter in the car and got in there and I uh, got to the gate and the guard didn't know what I was talking about. He said, well, Mr. Herman, it's 5.30 in the afternoon. Our information officer has been off duty since 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I said, well, somebody called me at 3.30 and told me to come out here by 5.30. And he said, well, wait right here. So I waited and waited and waited and finally about 20 minutes later, uh, up drives this station wagon out, gets this uh, fellow in civilian clothes. Mm -hmm. Walks up to me and says, hello, I'm Wade King. What can I do for you? And I said, well, sir, uh, somebody from your office called me 
He said, you were interested in seeing my photographs. He said, what photographs? I said, this photograph of the UFO I took. Mm -hmm. He looked at me and he says, wait, wait right here. So he went to the guard shack. Five minutes later, up walks the guard in uniform with a sidearm, puts his hand on the window of the car and says, are you military? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, sir, I'm not. He looked at me like I was born yesterday and he said, well, let me tell you this. He said, why don't you turn the photograph? The photo session at this site was most intriguing. Had Bill simply followed a hunch, or had he been telepathically guided to the location? Another mystery without any clues. Like I say, I, I was a work. And I left work to come home. I was on my way home. Uh -huh. And on my way home, I, I had that thought. It was like a impulse see, telling me to, you know, do, go somewhere. And I, I started to think, where should I go for myself? And then it was like in my mind, I got a mental picture of this area. Uh -huh. And I knew it was near the air base. I knew where everybody parked. Got back here. And I wasn't back here 10 minutes. And I could see the object. I don't know exactly where I saw it first, mm -hmm. but it like it circled the area, and I saw it. And I saw the first thing I noticed was it was much smaller. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was prior to other ones were anywhere from 40 to 65 foot in diameter, but this one was 20, 30 foot. And uh, another thing was it was very, very different. It was mm -hmm. different in the sense that instead of being orange and silver, mm -hmm. it was uh, just like a silver metal appearance. Yeah. And not only that, but it had two bones, one of them on top of the object and one of them underneath it. But it looked sealed in metal. In other words, it, you didn't see no windows and no holes and nothing. No windows? No. Oh. You did not see any windows. It was just surface metal all the way around. I Almost know. like sheet metal formed into the shape of a, a disc with two domes. How one on top, one on the bottom. How was the, uh, the dome? Uh, was it uh, transparency? Or? No, it was solid metal solid. with the rest of the disc. And it was all colored silver with the sun shining off it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just beautiful silver like aluminum or sheet metal. Or, How did it fly? I don't know. I did not hear any noise. It was like, it was that, in that sense, it was like the other objects because it made absolutely no noise. I mean, it would go up like this and come back like this. Come around like that. And just watching it was, you know, it was hard. Uh -huh. Because when it would go that way, I'd run across the field, and I'm trying to get it in a viewfinder, mm -hmm. and I took about four or five shots like that, uh -huh. and I believe two or three of them came out, mm -hmm. and two came out in empty sky. Well, in the course of the sighting, the object was going like this way, mm -hmm. and then it reversed course and went back that way until mm -hmm. it was like hiding behind some trees over there. Yeah. And I, I stopped, and I thought for a moment it was going to be gone, but instead... I saw an airplane coming uh -huh. this way, uh -huh. and you know I saw it getting closer and closer. At the same time, the airplane was halfway from those trees to where I was at. The object came from behind the trees to start to follow the airplane. Oh. So, and the, the way the airplane was, the airplane was coming in like this, and the object was like coming around like this. It started to come around like this, and instead it went back this way, and on these sides of the trees. Oh. And when, as the C-130 passed over me, I took a picture of it. And then I swung back. By that time, the object had gone back over here. Uh -huh. And then it started to go back. I took some more pictures of it. And it came over me like this.
So you arrived to find the man distraught here, and he took you out to kill you. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Herman came over to me in a very excited manner and told me that, first, I would not believe what had happened to him. And I just expected the worst. I didn't know what to believe. And he said he'd been in his yard in North Charleston, which is about 15 miles from here. And the next thing he knew, he was here in this field near Somerville. Right out in, right in the middle of the field is where he said he was seen too. He doesn't really remember too much of what had happened that night. He said he'd been watching a bright light. It kept getting closer and closer. And the next thing he knew, he was here in this field and he told me he believed he'd been brought here by a UFO. He was very excited, nervous. Uh, I really have never seen a man that excited, you know, it's hard to put in words, but very excited is about all I could say. Distressed, he couldn't remember what had happened to him. There was, you know, a small part of his life was blank. Bill could only remember small fragments of hazy images, images that resembled a strange mosaic tapestry of colors and things. The object approaching, falling backwards, the field of grass swaying in silence. Struggling in a bluish light to bathe the railroad tracks, then black out. Stevens knew he would have to bring in a specialist in hypnotic regression, someone capable of unlocking Bill's scrambled memory. But this would take time to set up. In the meantime, he would call in Junichi Aoi, a seasoned UFO investigator with the Nippon Television Network. And between the two men, they would carefully reconstruct the strange events that led up to Herman's abduction. Three months earlier, this had been a construction site for a new subdivision. It had offered Bill and his wife Patty a panoramic view of the surrounding area to observe the bright, noiseless object in the night sky. Particular evening we were out here. He was sitting. It was about a little after 9:30.